Kapp, biblical archaeologist and historian. The sole survivor of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the great pyramid of Giza in Egypt. And many films and television programs have been made over the past several years, purporting to be in-depth studies of the origin and purpose of this, the largest man-made structure. <laughs> Many very fanciful ideas have been dreamed up by misty-eyed screenwriters in the hope of providing sensational material for television programs, even going so far as to suggest that a building of such massive building blocks could only have been put in place by extraterrestrials or Martians. Let us then dispose of these science fiction myths and legends and get down to hard facts. What all the writers and researchers missed in their surveys and studies was a great secret hidden inside the internal passage system of the pyramid. A secret only lately revealed, as we shall now see. Egypt, a land of wonders, of Ramesses and Pharaohs, of Joseph and Moses, a land in which today the dead alone are great. God has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day. The great pyramid of Giza is the greatest wonder of the world, even to this day. There is an ancient Egyptian tradition that says, the plans were let down from heaven, or as we would say today, they were divinely inspired. We know that for centuries, an aura of mystery has enveloped the Great Pyramid. So, why was it built? What was it? Answers to these questions have ranged from the fantastic to the ridiculous. Among the theories was that the pyramid contained cooking vessels that would not rust, glass that could bend without breaking, and that it contained books revealing mysteries of science, astronomy, and physics, which any person of understanding who could interpret that writing would thereby benefit from it. They were closer to... It is generally taught that the Great Pyramid was a tomb of the ancient pharaoh Khufu, or Cheops, as the Greeks called him. However, there are many puzzling aspects of the pyramid that contradict the tomb theory and leads one to consider. Is the Great Pyramid the wonder of which Jeremiah wrote? It is located in the southern hemisphere in the exact center of the fan-shaped delta formed by the River Nile. And it is also on the dividing line between Upper and Lower Egypt. It is interesting to note that the Great Pyramid is called the Pyramid of Giza, an Egyptian word that means border. There are about 80 pyramids in Egypt, built over a period of a thousand years between the 27th and 18th centuries BC. The most important are those found on the Giza Plateau, the most famous being the Great Pyramid, the sole remainder. The Great Pyramid was a result of accumulated knowledge of pyramid building, which started around 2700 BC with the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, built by King Zoser, the first king of the third Egyptian dynasty. It rises in six unequal steps to a height of about 216 feet and has a rectangular base measuring 411 feet from east to west. But also a complete residence with temples, courtyards, a private tomb that was found to contain only an empty sarcophagus. Zoser's personal advisor, doctor, priest, and architect was a mysterious scholar named Imhotep who designed Zoser's step. Imhotep was found at Saqqara, but it fails to tell us much about him. However, the similarities of his architecture, with his characteristic panel facades and Egyptian hieroglyphics of his period, 
both of which are similar to those found in ancient Sumer in Mesopotamia in modern Iraq, suggest that Imhotep and the founders of the early dynasties were descendants of Noah's sons who occupied Sumer shortly after the flood. B, the corrective date for Noah's flood. A short distance from Saqqara are found several pyramids, Madam and Dashur, the so-called Bip Pyramid, because when being constructed, the builders found the slope was too steep, so they changed the angle. The Northern Pyramid was built at the same reduced angle. The strange-looking pyramid at Medum dominates the area for many miles. Tower standing on a hill at the edge of the desert. It appears to have been the final development of the step pyramid design. It is now believed that these pyramids, preceding the Great Pyramid, were built under the direction of the Hyksos, who were descendants of Seth, the son of Noah, who were living during this period in Arabia. They were the vanguard of a migration of technicians planning the construction of the Great Pyramid. To build a natural stone, in preparation, the greatest building ever constructed by human art the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Great Pyramid is the first and largest of the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau, although the second pyramid appears to be larger, having been built on a slightly higher ground. Each pyramid has one or more accompanying minor pyramids designed the king's family, wives, and daughters. Court were allowed to place their tombs around the area. It was during the reign of Khufu, the second king of the fourth Egyptian dynasty, that the Great Pyramid was built, starting in 2623 BC. His cartouche or name is seen on this stele or plaque on the left. It is quite possible that Khufu himself was one of the Shepherd Kings, although historians identify them with the 15th dynasty. His name on Egyptian monumental lists appears as Shufu, as do his sons. Shufu in Egyptian means long hair, thus distinguishing him from the Egyptians who usually shave their heads or cut their hair short. Some of the higher officials wore wigs. Khufu's pyramid was 185 feet, but was left slightly lower as its capstone was never placed in position. Its present height is 454 and a half feet, equal to a modern 48-story building. Its base covers 13 acres, and each of its side walls covers five and a half acres. The second pyramid was built by Khufu's son, Khafre, or Kephren as the Greeks call him. It stands 450 feet in some of its casing stones, although badly weathered by time. Kephren's pyramid has associated with it the most complete pyramid complex of the Giza Plateau. A causeway, a mortuary temple, various chambers, and a great court surrounded by a colonnade supported on massive rectangular pillars. Kefren is credited with the construction of the Great Sphinx carved out of the solid rock used as a quarry, the pyramid's core masonry. Because of an inferior hardness, it was left, and later it was decided to carve it into a monument instead of removing it. Kefren's architect decided to transform it into a sublime likeness of his royal master. The face is that of Kefren, but the body is that of a lion, to denote strength. And it's 66 feet high. It was originally painted red and had a beard which has now broken away, but probably looked like this. The Sphinx today 
is in a somewhat dilapidated condition and restoration work is currently underway. Did you know that the Sphinx has a tail? Yes, it really does. It can be seen on the right. The third of the three major pyramids at Giza was built by Minkur, or Mykurinus, as the Greeks called him. This pyramid is only 216 feet high, with a side base of 356 feet. It's the smaller size is offset by the splendid appearance of the granite casing stones, which cover the lowest 16 courses. Minkuri died before his pyramid was finished, and the outer casing stones were never completed. The likeness of the king was found in this limestone head. The Great Pyramid is the most perfectly orientated building in the world. Its sides face north, south, east, and west, with only three minutes of one degree off of true north. And this is the result, probably, of earthquakes throughout the centuries. By way of comparison, the Paris Observatory is six minutes. When one examines the Great Pyramid today, they are not seeing a finished product, but only the filling or core, consisting of two million 300,000 yellow limestone blocks, weighing about two and a half tons each, enough to build 30 Empire State buildings. The courses of stone are uniform in thickness, but each course varies from the, the fifth course measured 50 inch pyramid inches. I'll explain pyramid inches later. Before starting to lay the stones for the pyramid, the builders first bored an inclined shaft into the solid rock base some 350 feet long. And at an angle of 26 degrees, 18 minutes, 9.7 seconds. And was aligned on the then North Pole Star, Alfred Duconis. Our present pole star, Stella Polaris, is one and a half degrees off of true north. The builders then used the inclined bore as a datum plane or reference for the entire subsequent passage system. The builders also laid socket stones at the four corners of the pyramid to act as rollers to offset any earth movements. The invention or modern For unknown reasons, a fifth socket stone was added in one corner. After the first course of core stones were laid, the outer casing stones were started on a foundation platform of limestone, and against so-called backing blocks, a thin layer of mortar was spread on the stones against which the casing stones were to fit. The fitting of the casing stones exhibit an amazing degree of accuracy. Meet one fiftieth part of an inch, and the mean variation from a straight line is only one hundredth part of an inch. These joints were filled with a finely ground cement, using fine sand, birds' eggs, and milk. The sides of the Great Pyramid incline ten feet horizontally for every nine feet upward. You may be wondering what happened to the outer cake. There have been 144,000 of them, weighing some 20 tons each. The answer is that the pyramid retained them for about 1,300 years before an earthquake dislodged some of them. To save labor working new stones, builders of later projects used the loose stones 
and then started to use the pyramid as a quarry. An Egyptian historian wrote that an application stones had been removed. However, a few that had been hidden in the sand were found and excavated by Colonel Howard Rice, an English Egyptologist. Colonel Rice made several other notable discoveries inside the Great Pyramid, which I will cover later. Herodotus, the classic historian, tells us that it took 100,000 men working 30 years to build the Great Pyramid, 10 years repairing the site, and local quarries supplied the core stones, but the beautiful outer casing stones came from Tura, some distance up the Nile River. There, the limestone blocks were dressed before being loaded into boats waiting at the docks on the riverbanks. From whence they were floated down the river to the construction site at Giza. Boats used in transporting the stones were probably barge-type flat-bottom craft with a central single mast and a square sick to assist the rollers. Egyptian tomb drawings depict how the stones were transported on sledges pulled by manpower. A mixture of mud and water eased the sledge along on its rollers and up the ramps on the sides of the construction one rat being used to bring empty sledges back down. Herodotus also tells us that the workmen were not slaves, but were paid wages with benefits, such as paid vacations and free rations while working. Benefits, labor enjoys today. The core blocks were laid starting from the center and working out in all directions and stopping where the casing stones were to be placed. When the pyramid reached the required height, the ramps were removed as the outer casing stones were dressed and finished, starting at the top and working down. The sloping face of each casing stone was cut to the exact angle of 51 degrees, 51 minutes, 14.3 seconds, which produced an amazing feature of the pyramid. Its vertical height bears the same relation to its base perimeter that the radius of a circle bears to its circumference. In other words, if the height of the pyramid to its base is taken as the radius of a circle, the circumference of that circle is exactly equal to the base perimeter of the pyramid. Do you realize that the builders found a method of squaring a circle without trigonometry? Just by using the pi angle, namely 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and 14.3 seconds, a fact that was to stay hidden for many centuries. Pi, the 16th letter of the Greek alphabet, is used to represent the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, which means the circumference of a circle is always 3.59 reoccurring times greater than its diameter. On the north side of the pyramid and about 55 feet perpendicular above the base level is the original entrance, hidden for some 3,000 years by the smooth polished casing stones. Over the entrance, four large blocks of limestone form a gable apex. From this entrance, a sloping passage descends at an angle of these approximately, passing through both the core masonry and down into the solid rock below, ending in a subterranean chamber. Hiding the entrance was a shriveled door of polished limestone, indistinguishable from the casing stones. An example of just such a door was found on an earlier pyramid at Dashur, one of the several practice pyramids prior to the Great Pyramid. Just to one side and below 
is the so-called robber's entrance, made by Caliph al-Mamun of Baghdad in 820 AD. He and his men were seeking reported treasures hidden in the interior of the pyramid. With iron tools, they tunneled in about 40 yards and were about to give up in despair of finding an opening when the dull thud of a falling stone in some hidden recess spurred them on. A few additional feet further on, they broke hidden entrance. The fallen stone had been placed to hide the ascending passage leading up into the interior of the Great Pyramid. But later, having found the secret interior, Abamun's men rushed down the passage, firmly believing it would lead them to the dead king's burial chamber. However, they found that it ended in a short horizontal passage, which passed through a small antechamber, before ending in a large, roughly hewn chamber. No burial, no treasure. At the end of this chamber, a small dead-end passage was found, extending horizontally a short distance toward the south. And near the middle of this subterranean chamber is a square cut vertical shaft going down about 80 feet called the pit. Today it is encompassed by a metal guard fence to safeguard the visitors of this chamber and its pit. However, the real reason is still unknown. Here we are approximately 112 feet below the level of the base of the pyramid. According to Al Mamun's records, the group retraced their steps back to where the stone had fallen from the ceiling, and they noticed that the stone had concealed another passage sloping upward, but it was blocked by a red granite plug which they were unable to break up and remove. Before they could gain access to the upper passage, which they found filled with debris, which they had to remove as they progressed upward. The plug actually turned out to be three separate blocks, having a total length of 15 feet, and having no tolerance between them and the walls, shows the impossibility of the plugs having been slid down into place, as some authorities have suggested. They were obviously placed in position during the construction at the for the first ascending passage sloping upward at an angle of a little over 26 degrees is 1485 pyramid inches which is a unit of measurement used in the construction of the pyramid. This upward sloping passage ends abruptly but opens into a high ceiling chamber or gallery which in turn continues up at the same 26 degree plus angle for a distance of about 158 feet. There are ramps on each niches, 56 in all. Their purpose is unknown. The walls of this grand gallery are formed by seven overhanging courses of masonry, forming one of the finest examples of corbel architecture stamp. Before continuing up the grand gallery, the Arabs investigated a low horizontal path. This is a day called the Queen's Chamber Passage. This passage then ends in the Queen's Chamber, a chamber beautifully constructed of polished limestone, the east and west walls being gabled, the apexes extending about 20 feet above the floor level. The heights of the north and south walls are about 15 feet. Royal cubits wide, 11 royal cubits in length, and its center is on the east-west axis of the pyramid. In the east wall is a corbel niche extending one royal cubit, or about three and a half feet, into the east wall. Its center is exactly one sacred cubit, or 25 pyramid inches, south of the chamber center. Although the basic design of the Great Pyramid is in sacred cubits, the predominant is in Egyptian royal cubits. The difference I will explain later. 
It is interesting to know that the height of the niche multiplied by pi, or 3.14159, and again by 10, equals the exact height of the pyramid itself. Perhaps I should now explain the difference between the Egyptian cubit and the sacred cubit. Although the Egyptian workers used the royal cubit, they could easily convert it to the plans which was in sacred cubits because there is a geometric relationship between them as this chart shows. If you found that chart too difficult to understand, perhaps this formula will simplify it for you. It does good. Now that you fully understand the relationship, I will continue. The Arabs, thinking that the niche might be the doorway to another chamber, dug into it in a vain attempt to find Pharaoh today. The Queen's Chamber has two air channels for ventilation, which extend to the exterior of the pyramid. The one coming from the north, or right side, strangely enough, stops short by five inches from entering the chamber. It was found by the insertion of a fine wire into a crack noticed in a joint. Recent sonar tests indicate a parallel passage butting into the opposite. But no excavations have been made to confirm this as of 1997. A very small robot camera worked up one of the air ducts revealed a tiny stone door with metal hinges suggesting an undiscovered chamber. This too remains for future excavations to reveal. It is noteworthy that the ceiling of the Grand Gallery increases in height over the first ascending passage exactly 200. This is called the rectification factor, a symbolic term suggesting a correction of a symbolic displacement an explanation which can be found in my book, A Study in Pyramidology. This number, 286.1 pyramid inches, is a very significant number and occurs many times in the measurements found in the Great Pyramid. One example is the fact that the entire passage system, starting from is 286.1 inches offset from the north-south axis of the pyramid. This is an example of the displacement factor. Another example is the design of capstone which was rejected because it didn't fit. It was too large by 286.1 pyramid inches all around. Each side projected out 35.76, a curiously equal to the height of the great step of the pyramid which is a large block of limestone at the upper end of the Grand Gallery, the top of which is level with a low ceilinged horizontal passage, which continues southward, known as the King's Chamber Passage. The ramps of the Grand Gallery butt into this great step, which extends across the full width of the chamber. The face of the step is on the east-west axis of the pyramid, exactly halfway to the pyramids from north to south. A side view shows the great step, 35.76 inches in height, projecting back into the upper end of the gallery, a distance of a little over five feet. The horizontal passage continues southward past the step, entering a small chamber known as the antechamber. curious features, the most prominent being a raised boss or a seal in the shape of a horseshoe on the north side of a granite slab which protrudes from one wall to the other. This boss is precisely five pyramid inches across its face and protrudes precisely one pyramid inch out from the face one pyramid inch off the north-south axis of the pyramid. From the edge of the boss to the eastern end of the slab, 
This distance is exactly 25 pyramid inches, or one sacred cubit. Another noticeable discovery about the boss is that its cubic content, that is, its volume, equals one pint, and one pint of water weighs one pound. Thus, we find its length, capacity, and weight are united. Modern research has made a remarkable discovery about the source, the measurement we call the sacred cubit. It is based on Earth's polar diameter. The latest geodetic surveys found that the polar radius of the Earth to be approximately 3,949.89 miles. Converting this figure to inches and dividing it into exactly 10 million parts, the result will be precisely 20 one sacred cubit. This sacred cubit is more accurate than the French meter, which is based on the 10 millionth part of the so-called quadrant of the surface of the Earth, from the North Pole to the equator, a curved line on a not-so-perfect sphere. One sacred cubit, or 25 cubit inches, equals in American and British inches 25.0264, a very slight difference we suggest that our inch was derived from the pyramid inch in the Great Pyramid. The horizontal passage extending north from the Great Step, known as the King's Chamber Passage, enters the King's Chamber at the northeast corner. This chamber is constructed of very beautiful red granite from the Aswan Quarry, some 600 miles up the River Nile from the pyramid. Of granite blocks, all trimmed to exactly the same height, with an error not exceeding one tenth of an inch. The roof of the chamber is made up of nine granite blocks, each of which extends across the chamber from north to south and some five feet beyond into the walls. This chamber also has two air ducts for ventilation. One enters the chamber near the entrance on the north wall, and each air vent... The purpose of these air vents is a mystery to those who believe the Great Pyramid was built as a tomb for a dead king, as an airtight compartment is necessary to preserve a body. The only movable piece of furniture in the pyramid is the coffer or sarcophagus, sitting in the west end of the chamber. It is made of the same as one granite that is used in the entire chamber. It had hollowed out with some sort of auger and bit, which would have to have been of some extra hard, precious stone. Spiral marks can be seen running down the inside wall from the carving tools. It is remarkable to note that the cubic area of the coffer's walls and floor exact equals the cubic contents it holds, which is exactly one English bushel, a now outdated measurement for grain, and the diagonal joining opposite corner of the bottom of the coffer is double its height, and the diagonal of the chamber's floor is also double its height, suggesting a special purpose by the builders. It is also significant that the coffer is the same size as the Ark of the Covenant of the Bible, and that the King's Chamber itself holds the same volume as the Molten Sea, that great brass bowl held up by twelve brass oxen, which sat in front of King Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. It should also be noted that the coffer cannot be removed from the pyramid as it is too large to pass through the intersection of the ascending and the descending passages. The measurements of the king's chamber reveal some amazing facts determined by the geometric pi proportions. If we draw a circle, the chamber's width as the radius, or use its length as a diameter, the circumference of the circle formed would be equal to twice the side wall of the chamber plus twice its height, which is the circumference of one side wall. Another notable measurement is the distance from the center of the king's chamber passage to the coffer, which is exactly 286.1 pyramid inches. 
and places the coffer on the north-south axis of the pyramid. One might think that this was just by chance. If, but if so, can this be chance? The measurement of the king's chamber, that is its length, width, and half its width, all in pyramid inches, exactly equals the number of grains in our United States silver dollar, half dollar, and quarter dollar. Did the architect of the Great Pyramid know the future? Did he know that what was to be the weight of our United States coins over 4,500 years later? The construction over the King's Chamber consists of 43 massive granite beams weighing either 70 tons each, laid joist-wise in five cushioned tiers. Above these are 24 massive limestone rafters forming a gable roof. The five spaces above each rafter are appropriately termed relieving chambers to take up and relieve the pressure from thousands of tons weight overhead. A cross-section shows how the beams were placed together, running from one end of the chamber to the other. For unknown reasons, the bottoms of each slab were smooth and polished, while the tops were left rough and uneven. These chambers were discovered by Colonel Howard Wise in 1837 by excavating vertically upward from the inner end of the Grand Gallery. From a small opening, he found that entered the first relieving base above the King's Chamber. Since their discovery, few persons have ventured into these chambers of construction, as they are known. It made some years ago provides a rare opportunity for the chambers to be seen by the viewers of this film. However, unless you speak Japanese, you will have to guess at what is being said. But the efforts to gain access to these little-known chambers can readily be seen. We're known as Davidson's chamber, which already been open from the east wall of the Grand Gallery, close under the roof, and believed to have been made for inspection sometime after the pyramid was sealed to see how the roof was holding up. The other four chambers, unknown before 1837, are shown here being investigated by the Japanese team. There are no footholds, and it slipped at the top. All these chambers are floored with horizontal beams of granite, rough dressed on the undersides. Oh. These successive floors are blocked apart by squares of granite in the first known chamber, but limestone blocks are used in the upper four chambers. Evidently, limestone is used to absorb any pressure due to subsidence to protect the king's chamber as limestone was crushed first, and that is exactly what happened. All the limestone blocks were found to be crushed. Even some of the granite beams cracked. However, an example of good engineering. Hieroglyphics and mason lines were found in 
paint. The mason marks show methods of working and measures while under construction. The hieroglyphics revealed that the pyramid had reached that height of construction in the 17th year of Khufu's reign. Other Egyptian records state that the pyramid was finished and sealed seven years before Khufu died. This is additional evidence that the pyramid was not intended to be his tomb. A large way as a result of Colonel Weiss's forced entry. The King's Chamber reveals another scientific phenomenon, the Great Pyramid, in that it incorporates the portions known to architects as the Golden Section or Golden Number, which turns out to be the cosine of the pi angle of the pyramid, namely 1.618. This can be seen by dividing the rectangular floor of the King's Chamber into two equal parts or squares. Then divide one square in half and swing the diagonal down to the baseline. And where it touches the baseline, it will be 1.618 in relationship to the side of the square, which is one. Was it just by chance that the builders of the Great Pyramid knew the measurements of our Earth and its relationship to the moon? Measurements only known in this century, the so-called space age. Did they also know the size of the moon? creator of the universe, placed in the heavens as a lesser light. If we place the circle of the moon tangent to the circle of the earth, the exact portions of the pyramid can be constructed on their combined radius using the pi angle of the pyramid, this being 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and 14.3 seconds, which is the exact angle of the casing stones. Another coincidence? The Great Pyramid is also equally distant from the North Pole and the center of the Earth. How did the builders determine that? It is noted that the pyramid sits on the intersection of the longest land parallel of latitude and the longest land meridian or longitude, and that the land masses on the east and west of the pyramid are approximately equal in area size. Another notable feature of the pyramid is that sides are not flat triangular sides, but are angularly recessed by 35.76 inches, the same figure as the overhang of the capstone and the height of the great step. In arc, passing through this recessed point on each side of the pyramid and the opposite corners produces the curvature of the earth, the radius of which is 3,949.89 miles. This, when divided into 10 million parts, equals one second cubit, or 25 pyramid inches. Also, an imaginary line extended out into space from the pyramid's entrance passage at its angle of 26 degrees, 18 minutes, 9.7 seconds, would cross the Earth's axis of rotation at a distance precisely seven Earth diameters away from the center of the Earth. If the pyramid was located even a a few hundred feet away from its present location, the angle would be different. And that is not all. The height of the pyramid multiplied by 10 to the ninth power is 91,826,060 miles, which is a figure very close to the modern estimate of 92 million miles, approximately, the distance of the Earth to the Sun. If you are wondering how we know all these precise measurements, we were not able to until the advent of the era of the space satellites, which can measure by means of laser beams distances to within a few feet. It might seem almost unbelievable that the Great Pyramid could contain so much scientific information. However, to deny it is to ignore the facts or consider it all to be just chance. If you still think chance, then here are some more facts to consider as chance. The measurements of the size of the pyramid give in pyramid inches the exact days, minutes, and seconds of our three astronomical years, solar, sidereal, and animalistic. The combination of the last two is 25 minutes added to each year, which is the precession of equinoxes.
a period of approximately 25,826.54 years. This chart illustrates the precession of equinoxes. It requires 25,826.54 years for our Earth's north pole to point toward our present pole star and return to it. That figure also happens to be the sum of the two diagonals of the pyramid's base. The solar years are also found in several other places in the design of the Great Pyramid. For example, the anti-chambers length of 116.26 pyramid inches when multiplied by pi or 3.14159 equals 365.242353. Our exact solar year in days, minutes, and seconds. Another example from the center of the antechamber to the north wall of the king's chamber is exactly 365.242353 inches. And here is an interesting observation. If we theoretically cut the antechamber circle in half, each half would fit on each side of the coffer with no remainder. Why? <laughs> I have the slightest idea. It just does. And by the way, the coffer's length plus its width equals pi times its height. Although Alma Moon and his men found the coffer in the king's chamber, they also found it to their amazement and disappointment empty. No king's mummy and certainly no treasure. They, as well as all pyramid visitors over the centuries, failed to realize that the Great Pyramid was the sign and witness of which Isaiah wrote. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. It is most noteworthy that the numerical value of the Hebrew words written by Isaiah when added together add up to 5,449. The exact number of inches in the height of the Great Pyramid as left by the builders. That is without the capstone. Although the pyramid is built during the Pharaoh Khufu, second king of the fourth Egyptian dynasty, it should be obvious by now that he was not the builder, nor did he have the understanding of the scientific knowledge found in this design. Then who was the builder? And where did the information come from to construct it? Egyptian books of the dead record that the builders of the Great Pyramid came from Arabia. Now, Arabia was the home of the Shemites, ancestors of Abraham. Among these descendants was Jotpan and his ten sons, mentioned in the book of Genesis. They all lived during the period when the Great Pyramid was being built. One should keep in mind that they were direct descendants of Enoch, to whom God gave prophetic and scientific information and among other things, the times and courses of the heavenly bodies, which could only mean the stars and their cycles. The names of Jotun's sons are to be found in all biblical geographic maps of their period. They must have been the early shepherd kings who invaded Egypt and occupied the land prior to Khufu's time. Having identified the builders of the pyramid, we come to its most amazing feature. In the many chambers and passages, we find incorporated a prophetic history based on an inch year scale, which started when the building commenced. The clue to finding this key and why the antechamber was called the Enoch Circle 
was when Annie Chambers width of 116.26 inches multiplied by pi, result being a circle of 365.242. This, when converted to years, equaled the lifespan of Enoch. This suggests that each inch in the pyramid might also represent the year. Another clue was two astronomical alignments. First, the descending passage had a perfect bearing on the then North Pole Star, Alfred Draconis, the so-called Dragon Star. And second, a scored line in the descending passage 482 prim inches down from the entrance. This straight knife-edged line was engraved from floor to roof and was in perfect alignment with the star Alcyon in the Pleiades. In the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Only in 2141 BC was the cut line in perfect alignment with the star Alcyon And at the same time, Pole Star was in perfect alignment with the descending passage. Now, if we start from the astronomical date of 2141 BC and count back 482 pyramid inches to the entrance, allowing each inch to represent one year, we arrive back at 2623 BC, which was the very year the pyramid building was started. Then measuring down the passage, 688 pyramid inches from the 2141 BC date come to the beginning of the first ascending passage. Again, allowing one inch to represent one year, we find the date to be 1453 BC, the exact date of the Exodus, a date that started the biblical age known as the Mosaic Dispensation or the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Now, as we continue to measure up the ascending passage, past the plug, we find it to be exactly 1,485 pyramid inches in length, or equal to 1,485 years, which brings us to A.D. 33, the very year that Jesus Christ was crucified, which ended that age. which follows measured 1,881 and one-third pyramid inches, or 1,881 and one-third years, which brings us up to the date of A.D. 1914, the end of the biblical age known as the seven times period of 2,520 years, which started with the fall of Assyria in 607 B.C. When the sloping passage ended at the 1914 date, it appears that the inch scale also ended, and all attempts to this horizontal scale has failed to produce any significant happenings, and the setting of future dates is very speculative. But it is not speculative to look back at the geometric triangle formed from a point where the floor of the Queen's Chamber intersects with the floor of the ascending passage and the upper end of the passage. The north end of his base marks the date September the 29th, 2 BC, which is the exact birth date of The apex marks the date April the 3rd, 8033, the exact date of the crucifixion of Christ. Known Bible chronology gives the date of Mary's conception at December the 23rd, 3 B.C., and the perfect gestation period, being 280 days, brings us to September the 29th, 2 B.C., a shown in the Great Pyramid. Significantly, the baptismal date for Christ, October the 14th, A.D. 29, is also found in the Christ angle by moving the base measurement of the triangle up to the sloping passage, confirming that three and a half years after his baptism, 
Christ was crucified on Calvary. Eighteen minutes, nine point seven seconds. When applied to the parallel of latitude on a map of Palestine, leads directly to Bethlehem. Now, can there be any doubt but that the Great Pyramid is the sign and witness in the land of Egypt, as written by Isaiah? If there is still doubt, then it is against the laws of reason and logic. It is depicted on the Great Seal of the United States, which shows 13 courses of masonry and symbolizes the unfinished Pyramid of Giza, which in turn represents our nation founded in 1776 A.D. as a godly Christian nation, contrary to that which is taught today. The eye in the capstone represents the all-seeing eye of God watching over the destiny of this nation and revealing him. The eye also symbolizes Jesus Christ as the stone which the builders rejected as David wrote in Psalms 118, but the day will come when it shall descend to complete our national structure with a divine completion. We look for the day in which the apostle Peter wrote, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Uriah wrote of this stone, he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, he shout out, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Christians await that day when the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. After 4,000 years, the great pyramid stands decoded. It reveals that Christ is God, creator of the universe, May God add his blessings to this study. A more complete study of the Great Pyramid is available in book form entitled, A Study in Pyramidology.